I think if it goes red, it's good. Yeah. We're good. Awesome. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Good deal. Okay, I'm probably not going to use this mic a whole lot unless I'm back here, but I'm probably going to walk around a little bit, but I'll make sure to be loud enough and um, they say the mic here is going to pick this up. So we'll go from there. Um, and um, so we're going to talk about creating a winning website and focus on Drupal best practices. Um, and this focus is going to be a lot on Drupal 8, although a lot of things still apply to Drupal 7. So don't let that um, scare you away if you're doing Drupal 7 work, that kind of thing. Um, the other thing I kind of would say is um, feel free to ask questions in the middle of this. The mic is going to, we'll be able to pick a lot of that up, um, hopefully. So, but, um, but ask questions along the way. Let's kind of make it interactive. And, um, and if other people have input, feel free to, to add to it. This is kind of a big topic, so it's a challenge. I think I've got till, uh, I think we're in here till 1 o'clock today. Um, so it's a lot to cover. I'm just kidding. Uh, 1045. So, um, uh, but, um, but still, in 45 minutes, a lot to cover. So let's get going. Um, my name is Mark Shropshire. Uh, I go by Shrop out there on the internet and things like that. Uh, I'm the open source security lead at Microsoft. Um, just kidding again. Uh, at MediaCurrent. And um, but the um, uh, what I do there that's a, that's my title. But um, but I do a lot of security focused things. But also uh, wind up doing some architecting and, and leading and things like that. So um, the uh, so I've, I've been involved in IT and development. Uh, for, for a while and, and really enjoy it. Um, Mark, could you fix your garter spelling? Just spell it. Oh, I can do that. I'll, I'll definitely get that. Thanks. Um, and uh, did I put an R in it, an E in it? The, the A in your package. Oh, cool. Um, and, and at Media Current, um, uh, we, we build uh, enterprise websites and uh, we have a client services group. We're full service and, and uh, have design and strategy. Uh, in UX, all all wrapped up there, but known for Drupal development, but are doing a lot of apps and things like that now too. So, um, headquartered out of Atlanta, but we're all over the U.S. Um, and uh, so today, what we're going to talk about is a little bit about what is winning, what does that mean, um, and then the value of audits. Uh, and these are these are good audits. We'll talk about that. These are things. So these are audits to look forward to. Um, and what are the best practices that we're talking about? What does that mean? And then we're kind of kind of move through those as quick as I can, so we can kind of get into more of the live demonstration aspect of this. So, what is winning? Um, so, kind of, uh, how, how many folks in here are familiar with uh, KPIs, key performance indicators? Cool. So, a number of people. That that's a. Uh, that, that's something that a lot of businesses use to uh, kind of have ways to work out ways to measure their goals and things like that um, to make sure that they're meeting <coughs> the goals and what what's happening is is meeting some type of return on investment that the efforts being done actually are delivering something it, it's still a great concept even if you're in government or an organization higher ed it's still a great concept to try to apply because you want to make sure that what you're spending time on is valuable to the organization so uh, this, uh, the thing I like about this is thinking through um, winning as from the top down kind of, you have a vision for your organization, a, a vision for your business. What, what are the things that you care about? What are the values going on there? Um, and so out of that can drive your uh, goals uh, and objectives, kind of the things that are important, things you're trying to strive for. And, uh, and the site that I reference here below kind of goes into more of the details on this, but, um, but it takes you into the critical success, success factors, uh, key performance indicators, and then through the process you're going to collect the uh, data uh, along the way to help analyze this, and then you're going to calculate the metrics for the measures. And uh, so this next slide kind of gives an, a little bit of an idea, and it may be a little small, but this is more of an example of what that is. So you're your goals might be to increase sales in a business context, and then uh, your uh, critical success factors would be to, you know, increase. Let's say we increase leads, you know, by 25% over the next 12 months. Um, so that's that's clearly defined. And then how do we kind of indicate whether we're on track and performing? And that would be like looking at the percentage of users 
uh, converting the, to leads and compared to last month. So you're doing some comparisons over time. So it's really all kind of being data driven. Um, and then your metrics are, what are those data points? How do we get those? So it could be like analytics and things like that. And, uh, and then your actual measure uh, would be the actual, those, those pieces of data that you're then um, analyzing from there. So, um, so I think these are, these are things that are really important to, to plan ahead of time. And I think that's a real key to everything we talk about in this is, uh, it's exciting, I think, especially a lot of us that are developers or engineers, that sort of thing, just to dive in and say, well, let's just get started. Let's just start writing code. Let's start making things happen. But it's really good to plan from the beginning as much as you can and, and make sure you know why you're doing the things you're doing. Is that feature important that you're working on? Is it critical? Uh, how are you going to do maintenance from you know, going forward on a project? And having this kind of plan and these goals and trying to stick to them is, is really going to keep you on track. And it lets you over time make changes. If something's not working out right, that's okay. You kind of make changes from there and, and, uh, and try again. And, and something that I wanted to um, mention, I think that's, that's, I think this is great just in life. You know, there's a lot of folks who are um, uh, life hackers and things like that, that uh, actually may do experiments with health, you know, and things like that. But just the idea of running small experiments uh, and you know you've got a hypothesis you're testing and you run a small experiment you see how it works out and at the end you evaluate did it work out or not um, and, and go from there so you know if you try to you know maybe bite off too much on uh, maybe some concept or idea and you haven't really defined that well uh, in, as far as your goals and things then uh, running like a larger experiment you may be changing too much at one time not realize you don't even know why something succeeded, which it's great you succeeded at something on your project, but um, if you really don't know why it succeeded, it's hard to take that and learn in the, uh, for the next project. So we're gonna talk now about the, um, the, va the value of audits. So, uh, so what is an audit? Um, and this is kind of in context to the audits we're talking about now, maybe not the audits that, um, that, that uh, you know, audit is a general term, but talking about system and site audits and that sort of thing. Um, this could be a review by someone not on the teams. You kind of want to focus, have a, you want to have audits periodically of systems and applications of, by people who are not close to the project, um, who are coming in. So that could be internal, that could be someone else in your organization um, to kind of do an audit internally and, and look at uh, the systems, you know, code reviews and, uh, re you know, audit your, uh, your development and application system stacks, um, you know, security and all those. We'll talk about different kinds of audits, but, um, but it can be done internal and that's fine. Uh, there's also some value in having uh, external audits done um, because either you may have a small team or you just need you know, maybe some of the things needed to be audited are things shared across projects already, and there's just not enough. Um, uh, everyone's a little too close to the to the systems and processes, and so it's easy to stay kind of comfortable. Uh, you know, I like that this morning. Something Adam talked about was, you know, our mind wants to kind of stay in that comfort zone, so it's real easy to just stick with what what's worked, or you, or you say, hey, that's we don't need to change anything. That's worked fine, but uh, there could be. It could be great input and value from external. Um, so that could be reviewing the software system, um, a lot of the processes and documentation and things like that around a system. Could be uh, reviewing uh, the, the infrastructure that supports that. And e even if you have uh, hosting provided externally and you don't host internal, I think it's real important to still evaluate and understand how the hosting works and talk to your host providers, know more about how they do things um, and make sure that it's, it meets you know, your security controls, it meets your, your expectations and requirements of clients and all those sorts of, th sorts of things. So, um, and, then, um, and then other related systems uh, you know, could, could be continuous integration and things like that. Um, so, because there's a lot of systems that make up a successful project application website that kind of go together to make that work. And as far as the way I break down in my mind, kind of performing an audit, um, so really the steps in my mind is that we collect the data manually and we use tools to collect the data. 
Um, and a lot of that can be automated, and that's nice, but we still have to do some analysis of the data. There's some tools that can still do some analysis of the data and help break it down. Um, but you're still going to need, um, at least until the, the AI, well, I like to say the AI, has, has, has everything figured out. We still need to have a human kind of look at things and try to take perspective on that data and um, prioritize those findings. Um, so just because a finding comes in and maybe uh, a system has flagged something, it's possible that that's not something that's important. Maybe you understand why it flagged it and you're, you know, or you're working on a fix for that. But, um, but that goes into eliminating false positives. You, you absolutely do not, um, you don't have to, you really need to look at uh, system reports critically and say, is that really true? Because systems can misreport an item in an audit. Uh, Tool or something like that. Um, has anybody seen false positives on reports? Maybe like security reports and things. So it, it happens, and you have to. That, that's kind of part of the evaluation. You have to be able to evaluate and say, wh why is that a false positive? And a lot of times, and what I do is I'll see what I believe is a false positive. I'll write up why I think it is and send it to a security team, uh, maybe you know enterprise client things like that, and say, here's here's what I'm seeing. Here's why I think this is a false positive. I'll let you now review that assessment and get back to me if you have any questions or if you think that's you know not true. But uh, but I think that's it's important to kind of look for those. Uh, but but I don't want to understate the prioritizing of the findings. I think it's that's a real important step. Make sure that when you do an audit that or you have one done that that it's clear what is the most important thing to kind of work on first because you want to turn the idea is you want to turn. Uh, those findings that are marked critical and as a team agree on what should be addressed. Those should then go into some type of ticketing system where you say, hey, these are, these are the priorities to deal with and we're going to work on those next um, in, in a plan, that kind of thing. And, and then complete some reports, uh, usable reports, and, and a lot of times this is a combination of the output from maybe the actual tools that were used. I like to give that transparency to say if someone wants to dig deep and see the actual uh, raw data that was generated by tools, uh, by all means, here it is. But but also a report that uh, that has a, a lot of times an executive summary that an executive could read and at least get some feel, you know, paragraph or two to get a feel for what's going on um, with the process and, and the issues found, or what also what's good. So I think it's it's also good in an audit in a lot of context to say this is things you're doing well, these are things that are, that are that are good things. So keep doing those, um, or keep you know, continue to improve. Any questions about that so far? Okay. Um, it, With the audit of the, the previous type you mentioned, like, there is a system audit. So does it also include the front-end part, like the UX review? Is it a part of the, you know, the winning? Uh, oh, oh do, having a UX? UX review. review like, yeah. Yeah. So it depends on the audit we're talking about. So um, let's see. I think, yeah, so th this this gets into that a little bit. I'm going to step out because... It feels strange being behind the behind the podium here all the time, but um, <coughs> some, just some odd examples, and, and you know, you can break this out by need, you know, and you can certainly, whether, whether it's internal or external, you're seeking audits outside uh, from outside uh, vendor or something. Um, these are the types of things that can be uh, broken down, and, and UX could definitely be one of them. It could be part of uh, SEO digital strategy. Um, you know, you could have a design audit. I mean, you can call it what you want, but the idea is to. If you just if you come in from a Drupal context, just say we're going to do a site audit, that can sometimes be a little bit broad, and so you're not you're only going to be able to go so deep on all these things because a lot of times all these things, or at least a portion of these things, will wind up on a site audit, um, and there's a lot of crossover. Um, so security is a good example. Security, you know, part of security system is is also making sure you're not going to sell. Someone mentioned yesterday an unconference self DDoS. Um, that, that's not fun to write code and kind of you know or have something going on, but it can't happen. Uh, but that, that's that's a bridge between security and performance, for example. But uh, but yeah, design and UX definitely could be in here. So these are so you can have a general site audit, which um, I think is important up front to define these are the things that we're going to these are the tools we're going to use, these are the items we're going to look for in an audit. This is how we're going to perform it. This is what to expect in reports. So I always like to make that real clear up front. Um, 
it's a chance for the person who's going to receive the report to have an opportunity to say, wait a minute, but you're missing this one aspect and we, that's real important to us. And you get a chance to talk through and make sure that it's, in the end, it's uh, covering the items they want. But, um, and, and as you can see, this is a, this is, these are a lot of topics. I mean, it's, it's complicated. And it also is interesting to note that um, there's very, there's very few people that, that, that can say, hey, I, I, can, I can audit any of these topics completely and thoroughly. So it's, it's, we're talking about widespread things. So a lot of times you want to really look for somebody that is an expert at one of those topics. Um, so, so as far as best practices, um, uh, this is the Wikipedia definition for best practice, but um, but I would say in the context of Drupal, when you hear people say Drupal best practices, a couple of uh, things that come to mind for me is th these are basically uh, Drupal um, ways of doing things, and we all know that if we've done Drupal work for a while, when you're site building, you're doing development, that there's lots of ways to do something in Drupal. You know, you can, you can uh, uh, process images in many different ways and things like that. So, um, but usually the community or teams uh, or some group will come up with, hey, this is the way that we like to do things in our group or team that the community has kind of said, this is the, the best practice for a certain type of task. Um, I, and I would definitely, um, and we'll talk about here what, where you can kind of find those best practices, but because um, I think it's important, and along with that, I, I, I definitely want to say that it's important to to be careful not to. Um, um, scribble camera. Um, it's important not to um, just accept the best practice because someone says it's the best practice. So I think it's good to understand, like, how do they? How how when someone says you know X is the best practice for Drupal. Okay, why is it? I like to know why is that, and, and who, who says that, and understand what that means. So, you know, there are, there are definitely, for example, site building best practices uh, on Drupal.org. There's blog posts and podcasts, and uh, you know, your team members. So, you may have team best practices or organization best practices that are that kind of become standards in your documentation. And, and certainly, external audits um, can help. Um, but beyond Drupal, we're kind of focusing a lot on Drupal, but beyond Drupal, there's best practices and, and all the whole stack that runs an application. Um, so you could, have, you could have all the code and all the Drupal build out just great, and you could have you know, issues with your infrastructure, for instance, that could make it a challenge. Any, any questions on best practices from that? Do you um, have any examples of blog posts that you would consider um, reputable? Um, I would say, so, a, a lot of the, a lot of the Drupal, uh, a lot of the Drupal agencies um, that are out there have pretty good blog posts on that, and um, I would definitely say so. I would I would check out like I don't, I follow a lot of RSS feeds, so I still follow the Planet. I don't know if, how how many people still do that, but I, I still kind of keep track of that. So Drupal Planet is uh, on Drupal.org. That's a you can subscribe to the RSS feed or just look at the web page um, for that. But that that'll that's everybody who's got access, uh, who's requested access for their blogs to post to Drupal and um, to Drupal.org and say, "Here's my Drupal-related article." And the focus, the community tries to really keep that focus on Drupal things and helping. You know, here's here's ideas or the way we solve things and things that actually help folks. Not not trying to sell things so much, but. Um, I think that's a good start, um, and I think you'll start to find just in your your own reading once you start there the kind of maybe the writing style that you like. Maybe there's certain folks who write uh, and they, they uh, provide more code examples, and that helps. Or maybe it's just longer form text of process and how they dealt with issues. Um, so I, I would definitely start there. Does anybody else have recommendations on that? Uh, not recommendation. Well, sort of a recommendation. Just Make sure you look at the date on things, because there's lots of information mm -hmm. out there about Drupal, but you can find a wonderful best practices in, for Drupal 6, it's not really best practice anymore. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's true. And, 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 and to that point, to Drupal 8 uh, being so different, uh, you know, with all the changes over Drupal 7, that's, that's, that's true also. We're seeing a divide on that. So yeah, look at, that's a great point. I, I'm, uh, I definitely like to, to listen uh, to spoken words. So, 
I resonate a lot with podcasts also. So if that, that's another avenue that I think is worthwhile. There's some, there's some good podcasts out there in Drupal. Um, and um, I, I, listen, I listen to a number of them, but like, you know, Drupal Easy and, and Talking Drupal and uh, Lullabot's got a uh, podcast. I think there's some, good, there's some good podcasts out there. And it's just nice to hear other people in the Drupal community just talk about how they're dealing with issues and things as they make approaches. Um, and, I, and ultimately, you'll, you'll hear enough of things, enough people talk about a certain thing where you kind of get a feel for the best practice in a certain topic because you've just heard that repeated. Uh, which I think is a good thing. It means that it's kind of been community reviewed from, from that standpoint. And I do think the community driving these best practices is greater than having, um, you know, an internal team where they're, if they're, if they're not getting that external, you know, input. I think that's a big thing. All right, so as far as kind of getting into the live um, demo, and we're doing, we're doing good on time, so we'll kind of keep things moving. There are a lot of tools uh, to do, to check and do audits uh, of sites and to do reviews to make your site winning and all that kind of thing. So um, I've kind of tried to key on some, some takeaways that'll be helpful. I will get the slide deck up on the, um, the session page. Um, I will not commit to a time, but it'll be sometime soon. So I'll, I'll get that out there. But I, um, so the links will, will be there, but um, for these, but I wanted, I kind of tried to narrow down some, some ideas of some tools that I think are good, but not saying there's not other great ones out there. And, and one neat thing yesterday about the unconference is a lot of great tools came up. When we talked about accessibility, we talked about security, we talked about DevOps, a lot of fantastic tools were brought up. Tools, some of the tools I hadn't heard of, so you know, I was taking pictures of the whiteboard and, and there's new tools being developed all the time um, that can help you find uh, issues. So, so as far as, um, and, 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 I, and part of this too, I want to make it clear too. I, I know I focus a lot on having internal audits by other team members and having uh, external audits. I do want to say though, all of these things you can do yourself. So you can be you know, within the team and you can say, well, let me take a look at this report and see what's going on there. There's value in that. I don't want to, I don't want to misplace any value in that. Uh, if you're on that project, take a look at some of these things and see what, see what you think and then get um, extra help if you need help uh, assessing those, but we're going to talk about the Drupal uh, core reports, uh, like the status reports and um, uh, watchdog error reports, things like that. Uh, the uh, Drupal site audit tool, uh, which is a really, really great tool to get a lot of uh, input and, and overview of what's going on with your site. Um, we'll take a look at the example report. Security review is a, um, is a module that will give you a, uh, there's a UI component and Drush component that will give you an, a, a review of the, of, of some common security things that you uh, should, should watch for and, um, and, and really gives you a good idea on some things that could trip you up. You might not even really be aware of without looking at something, a report like that. Uh, makes it easy at least to, to dive into parts of the system that, um, that you might not have been aware of for security. And then uh, encoder for coding standards. Um, I, uh, I do a number of talks on code reviews and, and that gets into a lot of the coding standards, but um, I really find a lot of value in following uh, coding standards, whatever your team has. I, I, you know, from a Drupal context, Drupal coding standards are real important. A lot of, a lot of folks may ask why that is, and I really think that um, it has to do with the readability of your, for yourself. You know, you, it could be a month later and you haven't touched that code in a while and you go back and look at it. And if you've not followed those standards, it can make it really, really challenging to tell what was going on uh, with the code. And then certainly for maintenance for other developers. So, so be, be kind to your, your other developer friends that may work and other people who later may work on the code. So, um, and that's just, that's just one piece of it. But, uh, but Coder will do some review of, of that, that item. So, uh, uh, Wave came up yesterday as a Chrome extension. I know another tool was the Firefox extension that came up for accessibility. Um, but these are these are tools because I did want to mention accessibility. I'm not an accessibility expert, but Wave has been a great tool for me to at least take a look and say, "Oh, I'm seeing some errors. What what does that mean?" And I can consult with somebody that knows a lot more about accessibility and say, "How how's, how do we best deal with um, a certain situation?" But that is a Chrome extension example. There's a lot of others. Uh, manual code review. Um, you know, we just mentioned that, but that, that can't, that is very critical. Um, so 
the community reviews are Contrib, reviews core, community may review a lot of the other open source projects that run on your servers like Nginx and MySQL and things like that, but your, your custom code, your, your team, it's kind of up to you and the team to review that, um, and if you hire third party uh, folks to do audits of code, that, that is it. So it's a lot, lot more narrow focus on that review. So that, to me, makes code review real important. And then um, in SEO, um, so uh, I think SEO is, is, is important for, uh, uh, for kind of making a winning website. And it's a again, that's a large topic. We're not going to dive into that as much on the live part. But, I'm, uh, but I've got a link in here to a HubSpot uh, blog article that has a lot of the 20, they have a release usually every year, but the 2017 like top tools they use. So it's a good way to kind of uh, explore and, and have some tools that can help you uh, with SEO. But I do think SEO is important no matter uh, whether you have external facing or even internal. You, you, uh, you may have internal search engines across an organization of a large number of people and you still need to have make sure that somebody can do a search. If people are used to searching outside on the internet, outside of a corporation for instance, they're also expecting to be able to have that same type of search capability internal with internets and things like that. Um, so, uh, and I've got kind of some notes here to go by uh, to try to make sure I'm covering things on the live bits. But um, so I've, I've got a um, I've got a Drupal eight site here demo, and I'll put a link out there. But I, I, this is this is on uh, GitHub, but with some some examples, we'll kind of step through what it looks like how I think through kind of doing some audit type things and, um, and go from there. The, um, and again, please ask questions along the way. Um, so let's take a look at some of the, uh, the reports that Drupal gives you out of the box. So you, this is, again, this is Drupal 8, but I do want to say that a lot of this applies to Drupal 7. So from a UI standpoint, a lot of that's there. So if we go into Drupal 8's uh, report section, uh, let's take a look at available updates. This one, this one's really easy. This is you can do this with other tools like Drush um, from Command Line, um, but I, I purposely wanted to show example of what it looks like when you have out of date core um, and and the uh, between the Drupal security team and the, and the community, they are continuing to make this look scarier and scarier, um, uh, which is a good thing, but not to be scared. And, and this came up yesterday in the uh, the conference, kind of that that fear mongering thing. This is not like like scare people and, and, and things into um, worrying needlessly about things. This, these are alerts to make sure, the reason it may be higher alerts and, and may be red or whatever, it, it's, it's to make sure that it doesn't become noise. We see these things, we notice these things in reports and the important things rise to the top. Uh, two points I wanna make here is, notice we're on Drupal 8.2.8 .8 here which I think is the, was the latest version released of the 8.2.x um, uh, branch. Um, and then notice the recommended version is 8.3.5, so Drupal core has changed to the semantic versioning. Um, the, a couple of important notes. This is a security update, um, so, and actually we're behind a few security updates here. But in addition, um, one thing that's important to note, this, this is no longer a supported branch. So. That means that if a security release comes out for the 8.3.x, you may not, they're, they're, they're more than likely, Drupal security team is more than likely not gonna backport that fix. Um, they might, and they did uh, earlier this year in a case because there were still a lot of people reporting running 8.2.x, but it, it's, don't plan, don't expect that. So um, I think that means for all of us it's important to w watch uh, the release schedule and keep an eye on when the like 8.4.x comes out and have plans to start testing. You know, when it hits release candidate and things like that, it's good to start testing your applications, your sites, and have, have at least a plan for when to update. Because if you get too far behind and a security update hits, and all of a sudden you're under the gun, it's critical, and you have to update it. Uh, we talked about this yesterday a little bit. It's really tough to, um, you know, to do all the regression testing you need to do for all of the bug fixes done along the way. And uh, uh, so that's something to keep in mind. So you definitely want to do that. And with a composer based in, uh, uh, com with composer, you can update this using a composer workflow, uh, using a composer command to update Drupal core, and you'd want to commit that to version control. Um, 
some other things to look at under modules, we've, um, uh, I'm gonna kind of knock out a few items here that are important. Uh, let's say this is production. Uh, first thing is uh, um, we've got the devel module. We want to keep an eye on that. A um, couple of things. You might not want devel actually even in your repo so that it doesn't accidentally get enabled. There's also times where if you're okay with it being in your repo, then you definitely want it to be disabled in production. Uh, site audit checks for that, so that's cool. But um, and that's not just for the develop module. Anything that's considered a development module, even internal modules that uh, you may have that help our helper tools for development, um, none of that stuff should happen uh, in, in production. So um, some other items here. This is a, um, this is a non-supported module, um, and, and, and you can check out why it's not if you look at the, uh, the page, which I think I may have it pulled up. So this isn't supported because there's a security issue, maintainer didn't fix it, and uh, the Drupal security team just says, okay, it's now, it's now not available for download, but I can still check it out and install it, and I did. Um, so you don't, you know, if you see things that aren't supported, there needs to be plans to, um, to, to, to remove that, even if, uh, even if there really was a security issue, you don't want to be on an unsupported branch. But, um, but that's, uh, that's one to keep an eye on. So as far as other reports, uh, recent log messages. Um, these are the errors. These are some PHP errors, and these are, these are items to take note of. Um, definitely items to, to take a look at what types of errors that, that this is. This one, this one is actually an error for security review. It's a great example. And by the way, I did a check, and there is a, uh, if anybody wants to do it this weekend, there is a needs review uh, patch ready to go uh, and the security review issue queue, so you can go do that and help somebody out uh, on that. But it does resolve this, so um, uh, if somebody has questions on how to do that from a contrib standpoint, I'll be glad to, to help this weekend. But, um, but definitely check through the watchdog notices and make sure that um, you know, there's not any errors that you have questions about. And if you don't understand, ask somebody. You know, do some research, ask somebody if you don't know what it's about. Um, so I look for those, um, and you'll notice that you can filter by different types of messages. Um, even even under user, you can see who logged in and when sessions were started and things like that. So um, I think that's important. Uh, one thing that kind of bothers me here looking at this report is the admin user is called admin. That is uh, it's really pretty good. Your user, your main user ID, it's good to rename that something that doesn't have admin, doesn't have you know, super user doesn't say root, doesn't say uh, try me because this is going to get you everything um, type of login. So it's good to just to, just something of note. Um, and then this is, I find this really important, status report. The status report page gives you a lot of details. Modules can actually add items to the status report. So you can get additional details from modules you have installed. But this will tell you things like the last time cron ran, the, the versions of systems that are, that are running Drupal, uh, are your, um, you know, is all of your uh, hook updates run for schema updates for the database. Um, so just things like that. And um, not, not, not everything flagging necessarily means it's, it's wrong, but it's something to, to be aware of. So it says I haven't run security review. I've, I've done that via Drush. So uh, so that it doesn't know that I've run it from Drush. Um, so that's why it's showing here. But, um, but I think that's a good one to check out on, uh, on the status report. So let's talk about, um, oh, and I did want to mention, there's a lot of additional logging modules. Uh, I shouldn't say a lot, but there's a number of additional logging modules. Uh, we talked yesterday about logging history and the security session. Um, those are add-on modules that give you more insight into what's going on in your system that actually report back into the recent log entries. Um, so security review. Um, so this is our application here. And um, I'm going to run the security review. So I have security review installed, that module. And as a result, it has drush command. So I can run drush sec rev for security review. Uh, I'm, I'm inside a Vagrant VM just for ease of use here, but this will give us some output. It'll tell us things that are going on. 
All of these are indications of the, even the things, the items that say success, like I, you know, only safe extensions are allowed for uploading the file images, success. It's still good to say, if I don't understand even what that means, if it was a failure, it's good to know what, what is that saying, what does that mean. So understanding these things uh, is, 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 I think, real important. Um, so, you know, you notice here that, that there's some failures. Some files and directories in your install are writable by the server. That's, that's not surprising in a development instance because a lot of times permissions aren't as hardened. But this is a great place to test, okay, what would I do to, to resolve that? Um, in this case, it's, uh, it's my files directory uh, has permissions on it that, that it's seen like that. And it's because Vagrant, the way it shares back out to the local host. Um, but you can, um, you can uh, definitely test this local and see. Um, and this is a good point too, since I just mentioned local. Running these tests um, on your uh, test environments that are more like production, you know, it should mirror production ideally, that's really what you want. That's uh, something else you probably want to do too, is run some of these commands against those environments because unless you're running something like Docker where you've mirrored everything exactly the way it is in production, it's real hard to know for sure. And you will get false positives local. So that's security review. Um, and if you check out the security review page, project page, you can see the, um, you can actually see a lot more details about what it's checking for. And, and definitely, you know, um, these are great. These, these, by the way, if you're interested in this type of work, these are great places to get involved with Contrib is to work on the, these tools that help, help us find things. Um, let's move on to site audit. So site audit is a, is a great tool. This, this works on seven and eight. Um, and, and uh, but site audit can give you really nice reports, which I'll show you an example of. Uh, when you run it, and here are a lot of things that it, it tests. I'm pretty sure um, that, uh, that Pantheon uses this in their platform as their tool. So, um, but you can run this local, um, no matter where you host. And um, so this covers um, a lot of different reports. You can choose to run uh, uh, via Drush, uh, you can choose to run just individual ports. This is not really a module. It's a uh, you drop it into your a Drush folder and uh, for your a Drush command, and it runs there. Uh, so let's let's check that out. Um, so to run, so what I did to run my report um, is I just did this Drush. Um, all basically, this is saying run all the reports. Uh, output is HTML. Use the Bootstrap thing, which all that does is make it look nice. So you can send it to somebody. Uh, but there's a lot of options and switches that allow you to output different formats in case you want to send it to continuous integration, things like that, and where is it the Jenkins or something. Uh, details, skip insights. Um, so it does, it can, if you provide the keys, it can hook into page insights and <coughs> check some reports. And so I just output it to a report file. And so, so we'll run it, but I've already, I already have it here. Um, and so this is what it looks like. Uh, if you, with those switches. So you can go through that and you can see a lot of the best practices. And by the way, this is neat because you can see a lot of things that, that the Drupal community thinks are important to report on for best practices. So it really almost gives you the list of things. Not, not a comprehensive list. There are other modules that plug in the site audit and it is kind of has a plug-in type system. I use, use that lowercase p plug-in, but it allows you, you can write your own extra checks and add it to site audit. So, um, so check that out. But you know, best practices and, and um, you know, here's something that tells me that I need to uh, copy the services YAML file inside the default directory. Um, it's looking for that. So I could investigate that process and see what needs to change. Um, folder structure. Um, this is real important in an audit. Um, I like to make sure that the, um, uh, that, that files are in the places I expect them. So one of the things you see a lot with, uh, especially legacy Drupal apps, is maybe someone didn't know Drupal and they've placed module files in places that they shouldn't be. Um, and, and be aware that Drupal 8 now, you know, the standard places for put modules, it's, it's kind of back to where we used to do it, back in Drupal 4 and things like that. So uh, now in the root of, there's a modules folder in the root, and that is now where you, you can split up custom and contrib. And, uh, and core is all in its own folder, uh, but uh, caching is a uh, is some caching is a big topic. But um, but looking understanding how your site caches from the Drupal perspective, like with views, uh, and this doesn't audit all that, but from views to any custom caching you may have coded um, to uh, 
you know, all the way up the stack to Redis and Memcache and Varnish, all the, whatever tools are in your hosting platform, you need to really have an understanding of how all those work together because they can cause conflicts and issues and, and uh, you need to be able to explain if someone says, why am I not seeing the latest content or why is something stale? It's good to understand why and how to clear those things. Um, you need to chain fast backend on Appia and crash your site. Oh, really? Because they don't. They basically have uh, chain pass assumes that if it sees APC directly with the services, but one of the services, Appia configures it, but doesn't give you any memory. Hmm. So then it tries to. It runs out of memory. Oh, it runs out. Yeah, yeah. So you you could probably chat with them and see if you can get more memory. Um, they they might be able to do that, and then um, or but. Well, you just override it. Oh, okay. Got you. And, and then, yeah, and the other thing too is uh, when I see things like that, I usually go, is the, is the tool maybe causing some type of memory issue itself? So it's not the fault of the infrastructure, but, um, but yeah, that's, that's, all that stuff's good to know. And that, that's the kind of thing to share. When you share that, like people are like, ah, oh, I may be seeing that. Yeah. I've uh, gone back and forth with the core people as to, you know, they basically say, well, it's an improvement, it's an enhancement. So no, it's, it's a difference in the way it used to work. It's a regressive bug. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, that's definitely some good points. Um, and there's there's more here talking about um, uh, you know Git and uh, how. To, so there's some extra tools here that you can install um, to like uh, PHP mess detector, which is nice for custom code checks. Um, uh, but something we talked about we've talked about over the weekend a couple of times is uh, running these you know one time and saying we're good. That's that's not really going to cut it from security and just from a standpoint of making sure your site continues to perform well. You, you want to have a system that you do this periodically. And in, in any of these things that can be tied to continuous integration and run from you know, Travis or Jenkins or, or pipelines or something like that, I, I really suggest trying to tie these things in so that you get reports when things change. Because you could have a deployment and something, or something just go wrong that's unexpected. Um, from a content entry kind of standpoint and content um, uh, architecture, um, site audit reports on uh, the the list of um, content types that are available, entities that are available, uh, taxonomies. Um, but here's something that I think is really interesting. This is this this can be huge, especially on an older Drupal site um, where it's been used for a while. Is unused content uh, entity types. So, you know, over time, code changes and somebody decides not to use. Uh, they want press release two now. Content types at a press release, you know, or whatever. Um, it's really good to assess this and say, can we remove those? Um, uh, so any, any kind of, there's a few things here. So some of that can impact performance at different levels in the database with fields, like if you have unused fields and things like that. But there's also the possibility that, frankly, just confusion for people. They go look inside the site themselves first time, they're trying to learn what's going on, and they see these kind of types, and they think, well, they're here, they must be used. You know, same could be said for vocabulary, uh, for taxonomy, and it does list all these, which I think is really handy. Um, and this gives you some assessment of build counts and and that sort of thing. Um, the uh, we talked about, I think we talked about unused modules and, and things like that. But um, but I do want to pop over to the site and show that. So if I go to extend inside uh, Drupal eight uh, or Drupal, uh, Drupal seven um, uh, sites modules, but um, but in here, so this is core at the top. So I'm going to kind of hide that for a second. This is experimental. I'm going to hide that. I, I would, by the way, and this is this is the choice of a team, and you know, in the middle of development. But um, experimental says experimental for a reason. So just caution, cautionary tale there. Um, before you use experimental and you roll something out in the production, you you need to really read up and understand what uh, the Drupal community means by experimental and what that what implications are. You're taking on some burden of maintenance. Uh, along those lines, so there's a lot of exciting things in here, but um, but be careful with those. So, um, uh, so we talked about the difference for upping the 8.3 is half of those things that are experimental are not experimental in 8.3. Right, they won't be experimental, or they may get pulled. So if they don't get enough attention, they'll they'll actually get removed from experimental lists um, because they have to have progress, a certain amount of progress. So that's a good point. Um, so one thing that I want to mention here is. Unused modules. I'll use I'll use a because it's not core AES, which we already know has a security issue. It's unsupported, but it is an unused module in this site. I'm glad it's not activated, but we need to not only remove it 
because of the other issues, but we want to remove it because it's unused. There's no point in keeping modules that you're not going to use sitting in your code base. Um, it, it increases the uh, attack surface from a security standpoint, but also um, you know, can have other implications like um, Coder, uh, actually I think the Coder project last year had a security issue where even if the module wasn't installed, it actually um, was a security issue uh, because of one of the PHP files that could be accessed if you didn't have it you know, blocked from being served. So, um, so that's, just, that's something to keep in mind is that um, it is possible that uh, it is possible you can still have a security issue even if, or a performance issue frankly, even if uh, the module is not installed. So, um, so with that kind of, uh, so here's Coder. Um, this is an example of a check for Coder. Uh, it's pretty, pretty interesting. Um, I know we're getting close on time here, but, um, but this is, I think we're getting close to wrapping up. The, this is an example when you run Coder, um, uh, it's, this works on, uh, this has been around a while, but it works, I, I have this install that will, it's for D8, but it will work back to D7, um, at least probably D6, although I'm trying to run those anymore, but, um, but this can be automated very easily, D integration. Um, I like to run it locally before I commit code, just so I feel like, hey, it's the code standards are followed. Um, and there's also, um, Support now to do automatic corrections. Um, uh, there's a tool that comes that codes. I believe the PHP Code Sniffer has a tool uh, that. I believe it's CBF. Does anybody confirm that? Is it in there? Did I just miss it? Um, yeah, yeah. So the, the items marked with an X. Those are items that can be auto fixed, uh, which is really, really super handy. Uh, so that's an example. And if you run it. Uh, Command through the command line. Um, so this will this will run it. This is kind of what it looks like. And I use uh, I just have an alias set up for phpcs that'll run it, and uh, it takes a little bit because it's running all of them. But you can specifically run a, a module. There's some uh, there's an example. You just put the path that you're trying to cover uh, for that. Um, I kind of want to open it up for any questions before we kind of, I know we're 1045, but we're cheating a little bit on time here. Okay, let's say, let's, any questions, and if folks want to leave, that's cool, but um, what, what do we have so far? Uh, one question I have is, do you ever have uh, trouble selling this to clients, selling the value? What, which part, like code reviews or? Uh, not the code review part, but just like the whole extensive site audit. Um, it, you can, um, you, you can definitely see that. What, what I found actually though is uh, a lot of clients um, say, I, I, I want to have a, a security audit because uh, managers are real interested in security or they're concerned about security. And then you start to talk to them and, and can kind of say, uh, but we've also noticed some maybe accessibility issues or things like that that we could look at deeper and then you can have a chance to at least offer some other things to go along with it and make kind of a package of audits um, that can apply. But all you can kind of do in those cases is recommend it and say, here's why, and use examples. So a good, a good way to kind of approach that is, uh, is QA and testing, right? Um, you, it, all these things we're talking about, you pay up front or you pay later. I mean, that's what I use that a lot. You, you, you're either going to pay up front and do things right, whatever right is at that time, whatever best practices are today, right? Or you're gonna later on have to pay that price, and and sometimes the only way for a client to understand that fully, because you can give examples all day, is to, is to let them go through some pain. And once they've been through the pain of issues, um, maybe they come to you and they've been through that pain somewhere else, and you can kind of say that that was so so. How, how, let's look at how we could have made that better. It doesn't mean you're not gonna have bugs and security issues and problems and all that, but how do you? narrow that down and keep it, keep it limited. Uh, so I hope that answers that. Anything, anything else? Any thoughts? Just curious if your team uses any tools to audit their actual development process. Uh, recently we've been looking at things like our GitHub kind of commit and workflow and we'll just notice that it just goes out as we approach that run. Are you talking about auditing the 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 like more of the project management side of things? Yes, exactly. Yeah, and I'm not I'm not project manager. It's hard. 
I mean, to speak to it, at least from my perspective, is more on the development side, but um, I, we use Jira, and Jira has a lot of powerful tools. It's not necessarily the best tool for every team, you know, that you may not need that, because it does have, uh, you know, burn down charts. It has, it, has, it has all the tools I think you need to do that. I think the issue I've always seen is the taking the time to set up the tools and then use the tools properly. That's really... Or the overhead that it takes to track it right. Which is part of that, right. The, there, is, there is a lot of overhead. And, and like anything, like development or any project, anything we work on in this space, right, it's all about like how much effort are we willing to put into a certain thing. But, but you know, because every, everyone has tolerance. We have tolerance working on the projects because we need to get things done. Clients or stakeholders have a tolerance of how much they'll let you do on certain things, so it's a balance. So, you, and, and, but I would say this: each project should improve. You should maybe target like, okay, we didn't really, we didn't make sure everything was estimated for a sprint last time. That was a retrospective failure we noticed. So, how, so what's our improvement next time we start a sprint? Everything is estimated. You know, that those are. So one of the things on all this stuff, it's baby steps. None of us have all this perfect. Now, if anybody tells you this is all, I got it all figured out, I mean, they're lying to you. We're all taking baby steps, we're all learning, we're all growing. Everybody's in different places, so I think that's how you have to look at it. Like, we're going to make an improvement each time we go through. Uh, and to make sure, you know, if you're doing this, your developers are all on board, you know, it's like <coughs> or an organization where you were supposed to, when you commit something, you needed to put the JIRA ticket in the commit because then it would actually update JIRA with the commit related to the ticket. But we had some people that just would never do that. They would just do a commit without the, the ticket there. Yeah. So you never get you know, the project manager it was never sure, you know, oh, nothing's been checked in against this ticket. You were about to say something. Yeah, yeah. and I've seen some good work processes that did well. Basically, you, you, you can filter or kind of link the commits as well, so it requires a specific commit format, which is like a pain in the ass to get used to. But it really gets that's kind of using the same structure so that you might have required the chair ticket number to commit or one to take it. And I found, so psychology is huge. And I'm not a psychologist, but um, so it's sort of happy. But using letting teams like kind of basically self uh, police or self kind of you know let say say set up the standard, set up the process, but say letting people rise to that occasion and say because people will notice when when a, a group of developers are doing these things, they're doing code reviews well, they're doing these things, and it starts the the, the folks that then some folks will rise to it, and then there's always going to be people that don't, and that starts to become noticeable, and then you just see where things happen from there. But I think a lot of times people will, people who have initiative and things like that, they'll self-correct. Maybe they just haven't thought that that was an issue. You know, they haven't thought about it that way, and they see the example. So setting examples is so important all the way up and down any type of organization. Um, you know, so yeah. One of, one of the tools we used to combat that was we were using GitChat. And we linked hip chat to Git and some of our uh, pipeline tests. So if somebody committed code that didn't pass code or, or didn't pass certain things, it would do a failed commit and put it out of hip chat so everybody on the team could see that there was something wrong. Yeah, it's, and, it's, <laughs> it's the, the, the post of shame. Right? Yeah. So, we, we kid, but it, it's good. And I want to say this, it's good on a team to have humor. It's, it is important, developers, and anyone ultimately will shut down if they start to feel guilt and shame and feel like they're being beat up on things. It's so critical on a team to, and I'll just kind of leave with this, to make sure they're applauding, we're going longer, we're awesome. But to, to make sure that, that everyone, um, everyone feels valued truly, it's authentic, but also that, um, that you kind of keep people's spirits up. Say, guys, we're gonna get through this and here's how we're gonna do it. And, and you know, nothing's worse than someone being told, you know, luckily I haven't been on teams that do this, but I've heard terrible stories, but where they feel like they're beat up and they're, they're, they're told they're not doing good well and all this, instead of being like, here's how to improve, here's how to do better, here's, you know, here's the tools to make that happen. Because you can't tell somebody that and just leave them hoping that they're going to figure something out on their own. But, um, but developers will shut down. I've seen it happen, you know, and I've read about it where it's just no no production because they just you, you can't function at the level you have to function uh, and and uh, and have 
all the head games going on, frankly. So, I, I, does that people does that resonate with folks? I mean, it's just it's a it, it's as much head stuff as anything else. Hey, thanks for your time. I, we could talk about this stuff all day, but I appreciate it. Yes. So how about uh, something external like uh, we evaluated the sonar, uh, you know, for the audit purpose uh, for Drupal 7 a couple of years back. However, the room set which what was available in sonar, uh, the PHP room set, it was not completely covering like uh, what Drupal standards uh, are. Like. And it was partially covering it. We tried sending it to the client, but uh, they, they came up with this reservation that you know it is more like a PHP review, but not like a Drupal review. So, have you used or would you recommend something external like Sonar? I haven't. I've, I've, I've heard of these this types of uses, but you know I don't have any experience with that. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's important anytime you talk about the tools and all that. I think that you know up front. In the beginning of projects and as you can pre process just to just to plan out using the tools this is the way we're gonna test things and work with the client and the client has particular requirements they made. Mm -hmm. You just work out with them ahead of time on, hey we're gonna we'll use okay we'll, we'll let you use these tools or you use these tools to the code. I, I mean I see situations where clients require third party code reviews and uh, and, and that, that can be valuable a lot of times. It, it could be expensive but it, you know someone needs to do it because of requirements that's I, does that answer a little bit? It's just, to me, it's more of a plan ahead, and if you see issues with it, it's not covering things the way you need. It's just a communication thing. Um, I'm hoping now with Drupal 8, because of all the standards, uh, and because it's based on symphony, symphony and all that, I think it's going to help that kind of So, thing. yeah, we haven't evaluated for Drupal 8, uh, but yeah, and it has been some time, but yeah, we can go back and review. Yeah. And then Sonar, is, as it's an open source tool, it also keeps getting updates and, you know, rule set keeps on getting updates. There's probably Drupalism that it's just never been <laughs> right. built. Yeah, I mean, it, it was more popular for uh, other uh, things like Java, but uh, yeah, there was a PHP rule set which we tried out. And then there is a little scope of customizing the rules which we also tried out. But yeah, we can, we can maybe look at the latest updates. If it, it is more compatible now with Drupal 7 coming into picture, so yeah, that's something we can review there. Cool. That's, that's good. I'll have to check that out. Um, that's the yeah, then you get into all sorts of things like different tools for doing test coverage. Uh, don't you know? Don't forget JavaScript in there for test coverage and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Well, and coding standards too. You, you still yeah, need to have. Yeah. Sometimes teams may have standards beyond like Drupal JavaScript standards because they're doing React now or. No doubt. Yeah, that's like that. how I want to play with Coder. It actually doesn't follow Drupal cutting standards. Drupal cutting standards says you can you can put spaces inside conditions, except in certain cases. But Coder says no spaces. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely things change all the time, and there's definitely going to be um, you have to when you see those issues, kind of figure out how do we deal with that and how do we make it make it work from there. Yeah, so, the project, make sure you do documentation reviews. Exactly. Write, write a function and say, this 